Okay, you may proceed. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, thanks, everyone. The um, uh, California Privacy Protection Agency Board now returns from our closed session meeting back to open session. We're going to take uh, items out of order, given that we do have a lot of business, and I was able to work with staff um, uh, just before coming back um, to help um, to help order things. Um, so we will start um, this uh, after lunch session with agenda item number six. Um, agenda item number six is discussion and possible action to adopt a proposed regulation to establish the California Privacy Protection Agency's data broker registration fee. And that will be presented by Mr. Laird. Mr. Laird, please go ahead. Uh, thank you and good afternoon to the board. I know it's been a long haul already. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. This is really, I would say, more of a procedural change than substantive. Um, as the board may be aware, and I know Ms. Mahoney will be covering in her remarks later when she gives a legislative update. Um, this uh, October, the governor signed uh, into effect SB 362, also known as the Delete Act, um, which does a number of things, but a component of the act is to move the existing data broker registry that has been hosted by the Department of Justice um, to date over to our agency beginning January 1st. Um, with that, a registry uh, exists uh, a requirement to pay a registration fee and DOJ has historically set that fee at $400, um, but that is set in regulation. Uh, as the memo uh, attached with this, uh, these materials uh, explains, uh, staff is recommending that we essentially um, just move the existing regulation into the CPPA's um, chapter and title of the California Code of Regulations to make it clear that it, the um, fee is now within our um, our ambit and, and part of our, our agency's um, requirements. Um, but beyond that, nothing else is changing. The fee amount is remaining the same. Um, uh, although as, as Ms. Mahoney will cover in her remarks, SB 362 does then uh, establish new elements required of data brokers beginning in 2026. So just previewing, um, there may be a need in the future to adjust that fee, but for the time being, um, we are recommending that we keep it at the same level DOJ has. Um, finally, I'll just note, um, you're, you, you'll notice I'm asking you to adopt this, uh, this amendment to the regulations sort of without a formal comment period or anything of that nature. That's because um, the agency's ability to set the fees for the registry is exempt from the Administrative Procedures Act. And so essentially all, all we need from the board to do today is adoption of the proposed changes. And that will then be um, filed with the Office of Administrative Law as a file in print, meaning essentially um, once the authority vests on January 1st, they will file it with the Secretary of State and the change will go into effect automatically. Uh, so happy to take any questions, but again, um, I, I would emphasize that this really is more a procedural step than, than any sort of uh, significant or substantive step for the agency. Thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Any comments or questions from board members? All right, um, seeing none, um, I will be asking for a motion to adopt the proposed regulation to establish the California Privacy Protection Agency's data broker registration fee. Is there public comment on this item, Ms. Allen? Okay, yeah, this is for item um, number agenda six. Item number six. Yeah, agenda item number six, since we are slightly out of order. Um, and this is uh, the action to propose uh, to adopt a data broker registration fee. Um, if you would like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom or by pressing star nine if you are on your phone. Again, this is for agenda item number six. And I'm sure I'm seeing no hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. In that case, may I have a motion to adopt the proposed regulation to establish the California Privacy Protection Agency's data broker registration fee? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Worth. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. The motion has been moved and seconded. Ms. Allen, could you please conduct the roll call vote? <clears throat> Yes, um, the motion is to adopt the data broker fee in agenda number six, um, as stated by the chair, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. 
Board Member, Member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board Member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Board Member Worth. Aye. Board Member Worth, aye. And Chair Urban. Aye. Chair Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five ayes and no no. Thank you very much. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Thank you and is therefore adopted. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Laird. Um, if you need nothing more from us on this um, item, I will move to the next. All right. Um, we will now move to agenda item number three, um, which uh, is regulations and proposals and priorities, including proposed updates to existing regulations. Um, our presenter will be Lisa Kim, Senior Policy Counsel and Advisor with the CPPA. Um, this is part of our regularized calendar um, for this meeting as biannual regulations, proposals, and priorities, although I suppose we have a number of items that meet that um, fall into that category today. Um, it follows from its sister biannual item, which was discussed during our May 2023 meeting, in which we discussed priorities and directed and delegated to staff to work on a number of topics. I wanna thank Ms. Kim and her team for all the careful work on these and for taking the steps requested by the board in May. Um, if you could turn your attention to the materials for this agenda item, I'll turn things over to Ms. Kim. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. Um, so as we are talking about item three, proposed updates to existing regulations um, for circulated two documents. The first is a uh, proposed revisions to the CCPA regulations. And within them, you will see the proposals that we have made, blue underline in indicating any additions to the text and red strike through any deletions to the text. Accompanying that proposed text language, we have a chart explaining the modifications and it sets forth all the map modifications that we are making, except for non-substantive changes like typos, numbering and lettering changes and corrections to section numbers, et cetera. Um, there are two items that are marked and highlighted in gray, and they are marked with an asterisk. Those are items that we had identified for discussion today, but not all may require discussion, but we wanted to highlight these uh, to make sure that the board was aware of them. Uh, the first gray item or the first asterisk item is in section 7001, and this is the expanded definition of sensitive personal information, which I will use in short term to say SPI. So what we did there is we added a new category to the statutory definition of sensitive personal information. Specifically, we added the personal information of consumers less than 16 years of age. The rest of the definition is a reiteration of Civil Code Section 1798-140-AE, which is the definition of sensitive personal information in the statute. And it's included here for readability and ease of reference. This proposed change is made under our authority in Civil Code Section 1798-185-A1. That is to add, update, and harmonize the definition of sensitive personal information with the definition of sensitive data that is being used by other jurisdictions, specifically Connecticut, Delaware, Indiana, Iowa, Montana, Oregon, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia. These other jurisdictions include within their definition of sensitive data, language such as personal data of a known child, personal data collected from a known child or a child's personal data. If the board supports this modification to SPI to add uh, minors information, staff will adjust draft regulations on risk assessment, cybersecurity, and ADMT accordingly to the extent that it affects those drafts. Now, the second item that we have highlighted in gray is section 7005, and this is for the consumer price index adjustments. We added this regulation to address the increases to monetary thresholds for various items in the CCPA based on the consumer price index. As the board knows, uh, the law already requires increases to the penalty and fine amounts, the board per diem, and the monetary threshold for meeting the definition of business to reflect increases in the CPI. Um, it's noted in Civil Code Section 1798-185-A5. The only question for the board is which inflation index the agency will use to calculate those increases. Since the CCPA does not specify which CPI to use, this regulation is necessary to identify which one will be used. 
Uh, the CPI that we selected is recommended by the Department of Finance, and it's also used by the agency for changes to its annual budget. This change in the regulation will basically allow us to do a Section 100 change to update numbers every other year. And um, to remind the board that a Section 100 uh, change is something that can happen more administratively and not require a full rulemaking package. And finally, I wanted to note a few topics that we are continuing to monitor and may suggest. Sorry, Ms. Kim, are those the gray topics? Those two are the great topics. Okay, um, if it's all right, I'd like to check with the board to see if they have comments on those, and then we can go into the other topics that you've highlighted. Are there comments or questions on sensitive personal information or the consumer price index? Mr. McTaggart? Yeah, thank you. I'm a supporter of the sensitive personal information. However, I, I'm very leery of including the words you know, the personal information of consumers less than 16 years of age, our construct throughout the entire statute has been with the actual knowledge that the consumer is less than 16 years of age. And if we suddenly put this in, it's going to be the first and only place that we have an age gate. And we're going to like, now we're going to back in the whole AADC world of how do you know the kid's 16 or not? And yada, yada. And it's opens a whole can of worms. So I would, I really would like us to put actual knowledge because that's the standard we have in the statute. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. Other thoughts on sensitive personal information? Uh, yes, Ms. De La Torre. I'm sorry, I just wanted to support that change. It makes sense. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Ms. Kim, did you want to, um, do you have, does staff have a, a view on that that you want to talk about or prefer to? No, we'll, we'll take that into consideration. Yes. Okay. All right, thank you. Makes some sense to me. Um, uh, thoughts on the consumer price index? I, I trust staff's judgment on this. I think it's a good idea to go with what the Department of Finance would like, and just in general, um, as a process perspective. So that seems fine. Um, all right. Um, I apologize for interrupting you, Ms. Kim. I just wanted to be sure that we were able not well. For me, it's two forty-five, and I didn't want to lose track. So, um, please. Not a ahead. problem at all. Yes, I just wanted to note a few additional topics that we are continuing to monitor and may suggest additional regulations on in the future. Um, the first is um, the opt-out preference signal. Uh, we are monitoring, monitoring developments in the opt-out preference signal, such as Colorado's efforts of selecting compatible signals, as well as potential efforts by the W3C for standardization. Accordingly, we may propose updates to our regulations to provide more specificity for the opt-out preference signal in the future. Um, second, we have also been watching developments in the EU regarding companies charging consumers for more privacy-preserving versions of their services. We, we believe that our law and regulations regarding financial incentives already addresses these kinds of situations but we are monitoring to see if there's anything we want to recommend to enhance those protections. And finally, we may provide additional recommendations in the future as we continue to observe our laws application through our enforcement efforts. So I just wanted to make those notes of these additional topics for the future. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Kim. All right, um, comments, questions on the uh, draft? From the board. Uh, yes, Ms. De La Torre and then Mr. McTaggart. I believe you're muted, Ms. De La Torre. Sorry, you moved. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, sorry. Um, so it, it is about the whole draft. The main um, feedback from me is that. Um, we continue to not address the need to have flexibility when it comes to data use for research purposes. Um, there is no language to address this. The, I brought this up um, when we were in the process of approving the current rules. I understand it's difficult, but I think it's also important. And I would like to see that language included in the next draft that will be presented to us hopefully soon. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, Mr. McTaggart? Thanks. Um, and I would actually support that too. I think it's a, it's a valid uh, point. Um, 
uh, Chair Urban, I don't want to take so much time, but I do think it's actually, I got a couple of points I wouldn't mind bringing up because, and I think that I, I wouldn't mind if we could, I could just go through them. So uh, Ms. Kim is very familiar with these. Um, in section 7003, um, the change to D, which is the link uh, being included um, on the platform page, the privacy link. I, I think the statute says before. So I love the fact, I like the change from may to shall, but I, but I would love to have a concept in there of before the download so you know what you're putting on your phone. Um, I'm just going to go quickly through these if that's okay, but I don't think they're necessarily just all wordsmithing. Um, in uh, the, on, on page, I mean, on the red line, page 13, this is 7004. Mm. I'd love to, I've noticed something that happens. You go on a website, the pop-up comes up. And if you're just like, I don't want to deal with all the, you know, you 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 click on a link on the on the page you go to another page it takes you and the pop-up disappears and i'd love there to be wording saying if that happens it's not that you defaulted to saying yes i accepted uh your pop-up you know because they, they, they sometimes they, they they want you to do that kind of it makes it go away for them so i just i miss kim i just think you could just kind of put that in your in your future hopper um the uh Insertion on page 14, which is, uh, again, that's um, 7004-4C, acceptance of the broad terms of use. Um, actually, forget that. Don't no, forget that one. I, I won't talk about that. That's, um, the, sorry, in privacy policy, 7011. Um, I just wanted to... Uh, point out that the statute says that websites home pages are every page that collects information and so I th I hadn't noticed this before but that architecture I think would require the privacy policy to have a conspicuous link on every single page and I'm not sure that's what we want but I definitely want to do not sell and do not share on every single page that collects information but maybe not the privacy policy I hadn't noticed that before so I apologize um Uh, Chair Urban, are we going to, if, if we, if we approve this, is, is there no ability from, should I have all my changes, all my suggestions now before we? Um, so, um, I think that, well, and Ms. Kim, maybe tell us what it is you need. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm about halfway through it. Maybe I'll just say it. it might be just easier for me to say them. Then. Yeah. Well, if the question yeah. is, will it be opportunity to talk to staff and, or to talk about it, um, again, when they bring it forward? I think that's probably a question more than one of us have. Um, so right. is that correct, Ms. Kim? Ms. Yeah, I'm going to defer this question to Phil to answer, or Mr. Laird. Yes, uh, I sort of like the other work streams we anticipate, especially if we are combining this with our other rulemaking efforts or initiatives at the moment into a single package. This will, in fact, come back to the board before the comment period. Okay. All um, right. Okay, then I'm then let me just not have all my little wordsmithy things. The one point that I do I would like to bring to the board's attention though is um so Mr. Sultani will remember right after this law passed in 2018, in 2019, there was a there was a big um effort uh to we thought weaken it by uh weakening the definition of security and integrity um and there uh, which we were able to defeat in the legislature stop in 2019 but what's happened now in the regulations and uh, this is not a change but I, I do want to highlight it again so if you go to page 49 of the red, red line which is 7027 the request to limit use and disclosure of sensitive personal information 7027 m for mike two um, it, unlike the statute, it includes two extra words. So you're able to um, disclose, not listen to the consumer about disclosing per, uh, sensitive personal information if you're preventing, detecting, and investigating security incidents. And we took out the prevent and investigate because we were concerned that, hey, a business could just say, I need to 
I'm sorry, I'm not going to, I'm going to process your sense of personal information. I'm going to keep your information because I need to at some point prevent a problem or I might need to investigate it. So I, I don't quite know why we, we included that. It also comes up a little later on 7050 for the service providers and contractors, 7050 A4. Again, we've inserted to prevent uh, the, the two words, prevent and investigate, which makes that loophole a lot wider than it was intended to be. So I would just love it if you staff could kind of look at that. And given that the statute is pretty prescriptive and given there was a lot of legislative history around us trying to fight to keep it, you know, tight. It, I, don't, I don't love the fact that the regulations have now, uh, I think it was AB 1419 or something like that in, in, in 2019 that tried to make it bigger. So um, I will leave it with that. And then Ms. Kim, maybe you and I could, uh, I could give you some other comments later on. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Tiger. But I, like, I, I like the changes a lot. Thank you. On that last point, um, just because I was scrolling quick as I could to, to catch up, um, the prevent uh, and investigate, those are not changes that staff is proposing. Now, these are issues that you see in the regulations as they were passed in March. Correct. Okay. That's, that's, that's correct. They, they, were, they were inserted. This is not this change. They were inserted. I've sort of been yeah. wondering if we could actually get a get a get a revision to that given that they're not supported in the statute this is wider than the statute okay thank you Ms. De La Torre? oh just quickly um i have some questions um but i was thinking i would just send them to miss kim since this is coming back and that will be for an opportunity to maybe identify answers for them is that part of the process that we can see moving forward like when when this comes back if I have proposed the questions, then maybe we can have an opportunity to get those answers. It just seems more efficient. Um, sure, absolutely. I think, you know, Mr. McTaggart was focusing on the things he would like the board to also have in our minds. Um, uh, so if there's anything that you would like the board to have in our minds, now would probably be a good time just because it would be a more efficient way for us to continue forward. No, it's, it's, it's more questions. We didn't see this graph until I think like 10 days ago. And, and I just um, think that that might take more time than we have in this meeting. So okay. more efficient for me will be just to submit the questions and then um, wait for the responses in the next meeting. Okay, all right. Other comments and questions on the rest of the draft? All right, um, then I, given the conversation that we've had around process, I believe that the um, approach we're looking at would be something like the cybersecurity regulations where we can still give one-way feedback, um, staff would go ahead and be developing the package and then would come back to us um, when, when ready, taking into account what we've said today and one-way feedback. Um, if that's the case, then, um, I will ask for a motion to direct staff to propose these um, proposed update regulations to formal rulemaking up through commencement of the 45 day public comment period, considering the conversation today and to otherwise authorize staff to make additional changes where necessary to improve the text clarity or improve readability or otherwise ensure compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act. Um, and also to accept comments from uh, individual board members and one-way communications. Did I, I get move. it all? Thank you. I want to check with Mr. Laird to make sure I got that right. Yes, and, yes okay. that's correct. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. I have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. So the motion is on the table with a motion and a second. I'd like to ask if there's any public comment on this um, agenda item. Okay, um, great. We are on agenda item number three, regulations, proposals, regulation proposals and priorities. Um, if you have uh, a public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or star nine on if you are on your phone. And if you, uh, this is for agenda item number three, and, and we do have one public comment uh, at the moment. So let me Elizabeth Magana, I am going to allow you to talk. I've unmuted you. You should have, you have uh, three minutes. You may begin when you're ready. 
Firstly, thank you to the board and the staff for um for your work. My name is Liz Magania, and I'm commenting today on behalf of Privacy for Cars. I plan on providing staff with the red line of our proposed modifications, which I will read into the record now. Our recommendations are the result of filing thousands of DSRs for consumers seeking greater privacy in their vehicles. We propose one, adding three more examples of dark patterns under section 7004. For example, businesses shall not ask consumers to fill a web form multiple times when a single form with multiple sub requests is possible, nor limit the number of sub requests they can file per day. For example, a business that requires a consumer to submit one web form for a request to access shall not require the consumer to wait 24 hours before submitting another web form for a request to delete. Secondly, businesses that require the consumer to call a toll-free telephone number to submit a request shall ensure their customer support has the knowledge to accurately address privacy-related inquiries. Thirdly, businesses that receive a request from an authorized agent on behalf of a consumer shall not contact the consumer to instruct them to resubmit in their individual capacity. Our second proposal is adding language under section 7011, subsection F. Firstly, instructions on how the business will compensate the consumer for the cost of a notarized affidavit to verify their identity. Secondly, instructions on how an authorized agent can simultaneously make a request and submit documentation proving their authority to submit a, such a request under the CCPA on the consumer's behalf. Our third proposal is adding language under section 7020 subsection F, provide the consumer with information on how to submit the request or remedy and deficiencies with the request, only if subsection one is impractical. For example, the business may ask the consumer to submit a web form in order to create a ticket and initiate the request, whereas the consumer before had emailed. Lastly, our proposal is adding language under section 7060, subsection C. Match the identifying information provided by the consumer to the personal information of the consumer already maintained by the business or use the third-party identity verification service that complies with this section before requesting additional information. Lastly, I'd like to quickly announce that Privacy for Cars has developed a new opt-out mechanism known as opt-out code that made Colorado's shortlist. For more information, please visit optoutcode.com. Thank you so much for this opportunity to make this comment. Thank you, Elizabeth Magana. Ms. Allen, is there further? All right. Um, if there are any other members of the public who would like to make a public comment on agenda item number three, regulation proposals and priorities, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or pressing star nine on your phone. Chairman, I see no other hands at this time. Thank you very much, Ms. Ms. Allen. In that case, we have a motion on the table um, and a second, and I would like to ask Ms. Allen to please conduct the roll call vote. Yes, the motion um, is on agenda item number three, regulations, proposals, and priorities, as previously stated by the chair, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. Taggart, aye. Board member Worth? Aye. Worth, aye. Uh, Chair Urban? Aye. Uh, Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five ayes and no noes. Thank you very much. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Um, Ms. Kim, thank you very much. And thanks to everybody in legal division who I know were working on this. And um, we look forward to um, the next um, time that we see this. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we will move to agenda item number four. Agenda item number four uh, covers discussion and possible action regarding proposed insurance regulations pursuant to Civil Code 1798.185A21. Um, Ms. Kim will be presenting this issue as well. Um, the item reflects work overseen by the rulemaking process subcommittee which was originally Ms. De La Torre and Mr. Thompson. Well, Mr. Thompson was on the board and now Ms. De La Torre and myself. Um, at Civil Code section 1798.185A21, the CPPA directs us to review an existing insurance code provisions and regulations relating to consumer privacy, other than those relating to rates and pricing, um, to determine whether any provisions of the insurance code provide greater protection than the provisions of the CCPA, and then after the review, to adopt a regulation that applies 
only the more um, protective provisions of this title, the CCPA, to the insurance companies. Um, so um, I thank um, uh, Mr. Thompson and Ms. Taylor Torre and staff um, before um, I came aboard for their work on this and staff um, for all the work um, on this topic. And I will turn it over um, to Ms. Kim. Thank you, Chairperson Urban. So I'm back on item number four. <laughs> Um, to ground our discussion today, I want to provide the board with some background before engaging in the actual draft text of the re proposed regulations. So first, I'll speak to the agency's mandate to adopt regulations in this space. Second, I'll provide some background regarding California laws that apply to the insurance industry. Third, I'll explain the differences in scope between California insurance law and the CCPA. And then finally, I'll walk the board through the language of the proposed regulations and what they are intending to accomplish. As part of that discussion, I'll also cover some recent developments in the adoption of a new model law that would apply to insurance companies and how that would impact our recommended course of action. I do think this background will help the board understand the legal landscape that we are dealing with and will also inform the board's discussion on this agenda item. So starting with um, the first um, aspect, which is the agency's mandate to adopt regulations in this space. Um, can we have the next slide? As Chairperson Urban mentioned, Civil Code Section 1798-185-A21 directs the agency to review existing insurance code provisions and regulations to determine whether the CCPA provides greater protection to consumers' privacy than existing insurance law. And upon completing its review, the agency is directed to adopt regulations that apply the more privacy protective provisions to the CCPA um, of the CCPA to insurance companies. As a way of background, when we talk about the California Insurance Code and regulations, we are basically referring to two things. First, it's the statute, which is commonly referred to as the Insurance Information and Privacy Protection Act, the IIPPA and it's found at Insurance Code Section 791 at SEC. Also, we are referring to regulations that implement the IAPPA and the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act, which is the federal law that applies to financial institutions, including insurance companies. So those regulations are commonly referred to the PNPI regulations, which stands for Privacy of Non-Public Personal Information. Um, as you know, the C. C as you know, the CCPA does not apply to personal information that is collected, processed, sold, or disclosed subject to the GLBA. And because the PNPI regulations implement the GLBA, conduct subject to the PNPI regulations may fall outside of the scope of the CCPA. So this is important to keep in mind as we go through the overlapping scope of the IAPPA and the CCPA. So with this background, I'd like to walk the board through a few slides that explain the differences in scope between the insurance code and the CCPA. Understanding these differences in scope is essential to understanding which law is more, quote, privacy protective than the other. Next slide. So this slide uh, covers which consumers are covered under, under the two different laws. As you can see from the Venn diagram, the CCPA as a whole is more privacy protective because it covers more consumers than the IAPPA. The CCPA gives rights to all California residents, while the IAPPA applies only to those California residents that are involved in insurance transactions. So, however, there are some consumers that would be covered by the IAPPA, but not the CCPA. And specifically, that's non-California residents involved in property and casualty insurance transactions. The next slide. The next slide covers which businesses are covered. Now, not surprisingly, we see that the CCPA covers more businesses than the IAPPA. The CCPA applies to all entities that meet the definition of business, while the IAPPA applies to insurance institutions agents, and insurance support organizations that collect and maintain information about insurance transactions. Given that many of these insurance-related companies collect a significant amount of personal information, we presume that many of them would fall within the CCPA definition of IAPPA. However, however we recognize that smaller companies, particu particularly ones that just provide insurance support, 
services may fall outside of the CCPA's threshold requirements for a business. Next slide. Now, finally, we're looking at this last slide that demonstrates how the CCPA covers more personal information than the IAPPA. As you know, CCPA's definition of personal information is very broad. It covers all information that is reasonably capable of being associated with or linked to a particular consumer or household. In contrast, the IAPPA applies to individually identifiable information gathered in connection with insurance transaction from which judgments can be made. And the rest of the statute goes on to say judgments can be made about an individual's character, habit, avocations, finances, occupation, general reputation, credit, health, and any other personal characteristics. Um, however, there is a significant amount of personal information that the IAPPA covers that the CCPA may not cover. As mentioned earlier, insurance companies are subject to the GLPA and also thus the PNPI regulations. They are also subject to the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So some information processing in accordance with those laws may be outside the scope of the CCPA. And thus that is why the Venn diagram sort of demonstrates that there is a portion that falls outside of the CCPA jurisdiction. So one last thing before getting into the text of the regulations. Um, I wanted to update you that we understand that the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, which goes by NAIC, is currently working to adopt a new model law that would significantly expand the privacy protections insurance companies are required to give consumers. Um, in case you didn't know, model laws by the NAIC are often passed in their entirety by state legislatures. In fact, California's current insurance code is based on a previous NAIC model law. We understand that the NAIC is pretty far along in the process and the California Department of Insurance is actively involved in the drafting of this new model law. And we anticipate the NAIC potentially adopting this new model law in the second half of next year and that the new model law could then be subsequently adopted by the California legislature soon after that. So given that the model law may significantly change any specific analysis of privacy uh, provisions in the CCPA and the IAPPA, as well as the fact that the model law may be adopted before we finish our rulemaking process, we have focused our draft regulations on clarifying that the CCPA applies where the IAPPA's jurisdiction ends. So the first regulation, and if um, you'd like to take a look at the draft text that was provided to the board, the first regulation defines an insurance company to make clear who the regulation applies to. The second regulation makes clear that when the insurance company also meets the definition of business, they shall comply with the CCPA with regard to any information that is not subject to the IAPPA. So we plan to work with the California Department of Insurance to add examples that further demonstrate how the CCPA would apply to situations where the insurance code would not apply. One benefit of these regulations that we've uh, suggested or uh, proposed is that they would be future-proof to apply even if the model law is adopted to the extent that there are specific provisions in the model law that would be less protective than the CCPA, we can re revisit them at a later time. And that is our recommendation as staff. Um, I'm happy to take any questions that the board may have. Thank you, Ms. Kim. Questions or comments from the board? Yes, Mr. Worth. Mine is just is more general. Are there under any other industries that we need to look at in this regard, or is it just the insurance industry that has this conflicting um, policy? Um, I can answer that. Um, according to at least according to the adopted, I'm sorry, according to the statute of what we're supposed to look at, uh, the insurance industry is specifically called us for us called out for us to do this analysis. There are um, there are carve outs in 1798.145 that touch on certain financial um, and health laws um, like HIPAA. So, um, but this is the only one that requires us to do this particular 
regulation. Other questions or comments from board members? All right. Oh, sorry, Mr. McTaggart, are you? All right, Ms. De La Torre, you came off mute. Oh, I was just gonna move the moment you... Oh, okay, <laughs> all right then. Um, then the motion I would ask to put on the table is, uh, may I have a motion to direct staff to advance these proposed insurance regulations to formal rulemaking up through commencement of the 45 day public comment period and to otherwise authorize staff to make additional changes where necessary um, to improve the text clarity, to incorporate feedback from the California Department of Insurance. Um, I guess if they have more, sorry, let me start over commenting on my own <laughs> draft here. May I have a motion to direct staff to advance these proposed insurance regulations to formal rulemaking up through commencement of the 45 day public comment period and to otherwise authorize staff to make additional changes where necessary to incorporate feedback provided by the California Department of Insurance to improve the text clarity and or the text readability and to otherwise ensure compliance with the Administrative Procedures Act. I move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. May I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Lay. I have a motion and a second. And at this point, I would like to ask if there's public comment on this item. Sure, okay, we are on, on agenda item number four, discussion of possible action regarding proposed insurance regulations. Uh, if you have a public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature of Zoom or pressing star nine. Um, if you are joining us via phone. Again, this is for agenda item number four, possible um, action regarding proposed insurance regulations. Okay, we have Deirdrick. Um, I am going to allow you to talk. You are now unmuted. You have three minutes. Begin when you're ready. Deirdrick, are you, are you there? I'm going to try to mute you and unmute you again, see if it works. All right, can you hear me? Didrick, you have three minutes. Okay, Didrick, we can't hear you, but if you'd like to join us maybe via phone, we have the phone number. Um, listed on the public website under the agenda, and you can join us that way and then hit star nine if you're having trouble connecting here. I'm gonna mute you for now and go to the second commenter, but um, please rejoin if, if you'd like to if you'd like to comment. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Elizabeth Magania, can, um, I'm going to unmute you and allow you to talk. You will have three minutes, you may begin when you're ready. Hello again, um, this is Liz Magania. I'm making this comment on behalf of Privacy for Cars. We just wanted to flag uh, for the board's attention um, what, we, what we believe to be a major data security concern in the automotive industry, insurance industry. When a consumer has a total loss accident and the insurance company settles the claim, the carrier ends up owning the vehicle and a treasure trove of personal data is towed away. This includes phone records, text messages, geolocation, and much more. Unfortunately, the majority of insurers fail to follow the National Institute of Standards and Technology 800-888, which is also referred to as the Guidelines for Media Sanitization. The Environmental and Protection Agency's Responsible Recycling Standard for Electronics Recyclers, nor the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Standards for Safeguarding Customer Information which has been adopted in California under California Code Regulations Title Section 2689.15. This particular section requires insurance companies to design their information security program to A, ensure the security and confidentiality of customer information, B, protect against any anticipated threats or hazards to the security or integrity of such information, and C, protect against unauthorized access to or use of such information that could result in substantial harm or inconvenience to any customer. Leaving unencrypted personal information of consumers in vehicles does not seem consistent with the above requirement. Additionally, California law also requires an insurance company to notify any California resident 
whose unencrypted personal information was acquired or reasonably believed to have been acquired by an, an unauthorized person. We are unaware of any insurance company that discloses to its customers whose cars are now stored in a total loss yard that their unencrypted personal information may be accessed by unauthorized users. We respectfully ask that the CPPA board and staff keep these concerns in mind. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Liz Naganya. Ms. Allen, is there further public comment? If you would like to comment on this agenda item, agenda item number four, uh, regarding proposed insurance regulations, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature in Zoom or pressing star nine on uh, your telephone. Uh, Chair Urban, I see no other hands. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, I'm attentive to the fact that Deirdre from DOI, which I assume is Department of Insurance, wasn't able to speak so that we could hear. Um, so before we vote on the motion, I just wanted to emphasize that incorporated in the motion um, is requesting or directing and empowering staff to take feedback from the Department of Insurance. And um, this isn't in the motion, but I would, I would just ask staff to report back to us any relevant um, feedback they think is appropriate when they bring it back. Um, with that, um, with the motion on the table, um, Ms. Allen, would you please conduct the roll call vote? Yes, um, the, the motion is for agenda item number four, discussion of possible action regarding proposed insurance regulations as previously stated by the chair. Uh, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Leigh. Aye. Leigh, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Board member Worth. Aye. Aye. Board member Urban. Or aye. Chair Urban. Uh, Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five ayes and no notes. Thank you very much. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Um, I, Because we have taken things out of order, I need to, um, if, with your indulgence, remind myself of um, what we've covered thus far on the agenda. I believe we have covered all of the regulation related items and thus I just wanted to briefly return to the point that Mr. Laird made at the top of the meeting, um, which is that staff would like to be able to roll um, uh, regulations together as appropriate uh, in order to most efficiently receive economic um, input and so forth. I think everything's sort of eligible um, for that that we've talked about today with the exception of the data broker registration fee, which we went ahead and approved. And I think staff is aware of our expectations with regard to, for example, the automated decision-making technologies. But I wanted to mention that um, uh, to see if um, anyone wanted to discuss it further before we move to um, our next item. Okay. Um, thanks very much to everyone. Our next item is um, the legislative update. I'm just trying to find the name of it. I apologize. Ms. Mahoney, hopefully you can... Um, Number seven, oh, number seven, we have, haven't we skipped the, apologies, everybody. Number five. Yeah, item five, yes. Okay, um, uh, I thought it was, yes, okay. Start over, apologies to everybody. Our next item, or I will next call agenda item number five, which is um, legislation update and agency proposals for legislation um, from Maureen Mahoney, our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation. Um, this is uh, item number five is an item from our regularized calendar expected annually at the end of each year. Um, it is the legislation update that Ms. Mahoney has for us and presentation of any agency proposals for legislation um, that um, Ms. Mahoney, um, uh, our Deputy Director of Policy and Legislation and staff recommend to us. Uh, Ms. Mahoney, I'm sorry for the slightly um, stilted and uh, tripping um, introduction of you, but please go ahead. Thank you, Chairperson Urban, uh, board members for this item. I'll do four things. Uh, first, I'll provide an update on federal legislation, um, particularly children's privacy legislation. 
Uh, next, I'll provide a more detailed overview of two California bills uh, from earlier this year. Um, first, SB 362, uh, the DELETE Act. I'll go over the agency's work towards implementation for that one, um, and then provide an overview of SB 544, which amended the Bagley-Keene Open Meeting Act. Um, both of those bills go into effect January 1st, 2024, and will affect the agency. And then finally, uh, we'll look to next year with a bill proposal with respect to opt-out preference signals for your consideration. And then also, um, I'm a little bit under the weather, so I um, appreciate uh, your patience with me. Um, so first, turning to federal legislation, ADPPA, the federal comprehensive privacy bill introduced in the House last year that the agency opposed um, at that time in its current form over concerns about the bill's um, potential impact on California's privacy protections. That has not uh, been reintroduced in Congress. Our understanding is that it's possible it could be refiled soon, but its political prospects are unclear at the moment, and we'll keep a close eye on the introduction. It appears more likely that kids' privacy could move uh, in the short term in the Senate. Um, as you know, the Senate Commerce Committee advanced the Children and Teens Online Privacy Protection Act, known as COPA 2.0, and the Kids Online Safety Act, known as COSA, uh, this summer out of that committee uh, on a bipartisan basis. Um, and now the Senate is preparing both bills for a potential advancement out of that chamber. The bills are still under negotiation. We may see new drafts. Language is in flux. Uh, and the path through the House for these bills is still not yet clear given that that chamber has been emphasizing, um, focusing on a more comprehensive privacy bill, not just kids. COPA 2.0, in short, updates and expands the existing federal kids' privacy law, um, expanding COPA's opt-in requirement for kids under 13 to kids uh, 13 to 16, as deletion and correction rights, data minimization of purpose limitation, prohibition on certain behavioral advertising, and just the threshold. Uh, the bill does not currently propose to amend uh, COPA's existing preemption language. With respect to kids' online information, if the scope of COPA is expanded, including to teens, it could implicate more consumers and could impact more CCPA rights and responsibilities. For COSA, uh, this bill directs covered platforms to assess and mitigate harms to minors defined as under 17 online. It requires covered platforms to provide consumer-friendly tools for managing the online experience of minors, including those that limit the ability of other individuals to communicate with the minor and prevent other users from viewing the minor's personal data. With respect to preemption, COSA's current language is largely silent on preemption, so how it would affect the agency would be a fact-specific uh, determination. So staff doesn't recommend taking a formal position on these bills at this time, given that events are continuing to unfold. Um, but we'll leave that to the board's discretion. And lastly, with respect to um, federal legislation, specifically the bill HR 1165, a federal uh, partisan bill to update the Fairman Wiley Act that advanced at the House Financial Services Committee earlier this year that I mentioned at an earlier meeting, um, and that would seek to add sweeping preemption language to the financial privacy law. Uh, we're monitoring the House as of this date. We have not heard anything about potential uh, floor movement of that bill. Um, one last item, as you may be aware, there has been a lot of discussion and interest in AI regulation, which may overlap with some of the work uh, the agency discussed today. There are no specific developments at this time, but we will continually track. So next, um, I'll move to Cal California legislation. Uh, first, SB 362. Um, but by way of background, um, for the first time this summer, the agency took positions on several California bills that directly affect the work of the agency and its operations. I really appreciate the work of the board with respect to this legislation. Just to wrap up, um, upon the vote of the board, the agency took a formal position in support of four privacy bills, three of which SB 362. Um, AB 947 with respect to immigration and citizenship status and AB 1194 with respect to reproductive privacy uh, were signed into law. Um, I've been asked to provide an update on the agency's implementation of SB 362. Um, the two main provisions of this measure are that it transfers the data broker registry from the Department of Justice 
uh, to the agency effective January 1st, 2024, and task the agency with establishing an accessible deletion mechanism by January 1st, 2026 that allows the consumer to delete their personal information held by all registered data brokers in a single step. So in terms of implementation, obviously, um, you know, the biggest thing that we're dealing with is the transfer of the data broker registry um, over to the agency by January 1st. Um, so the agency first has to set a fee through regulation for data broker registration, which we already did. Um, and the agency also has to provide a means for data brokers to register with us. So to provide the required information, pay the fee, and data brokers would need to register with the agency by January 31st, 2024. So due to necessary procurement and implementation timelines uh, for things like backend payment processing, the agency will pursue a simplified implementation of the data broker registry, similar to how the Department of Justice operated the registry in their first year. This will allow manual registration by data brokers and paper check processing during the 31-day registration window spanning January 1st to January 31st, 2024. And we'll then create a page on our website where the registration information provided by data brokers will be accessible to the public pursuant to law. We're working to bring on staff in the near future to assist with the data broker registry. We're also assessing fiscal year 2024 through 25 resource needs for planning and implementation of the accessible deletion mechanism. And we'll continue to work with the Department of Finance and the California Department of Technology on the development of that mechanism. And then lastly, I'll point out that the legal team is taking the lead on implementation. Um, you know, particularly uh, Mr. Laird. Um, so if there are additional questions, I may need his help as well. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Is that the updates? Um, then I want to go over SB 544. What is that? Sorry. Um, that's the um, Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. Okay, um, thank you. I, the numbers just swirl in my head. I uh, apologies. Um, go ahead. So just and tell me if this will make sense to you. I thought maybe um, we would pause for questions or comments on the updates and, and then talk about the proposal. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go through this um, last update. Um, so SB 544 amended the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, and that dealt with the issue of the board's remote participation in meetings. Um, the agency took a support if amended position on the bill, seeking amendments to allow for fully remote online meetings. Um, those amendments were not taken. In fact, uh, more restrictive amendments were taken. So I'd like to provide an overview of the bill as a past, which is fairly complicated. Um, and I have a slide deck to help present these amendments. Um, Liz, would you mind uh, sharing these slides? So just as a preliminary note, some of you may be wondering why we're meeting exclusively online after having hybrid meetings for the last two meetings. This summer, a provision was added to a budget bill, SB 143, that extended the pandemic era online meeting rules to the end of this calendar year. Unfortunately, that means this will be our last online only board meeting for the foreseeable future. January 1st, 2024 through January 1st, 2026, new guidance will be in effect. The bill sunsets in 2026 with the idea that stakeholders will see how this new guidance works. Um, and the new amendments give the agency and board members several choices with respect to meetings. There are four main options that I'll go through. Um, a slide, please. Option one, um, this is kind of the old school way. The board can hold fully in-person meetings without remote par public participation. All participating board members must participate in person, and then the public would attend in person. Um, staff and guests can still participate remotely if necessary without triggering additional teleconferencing requirements. And of course, all of the notice and transparency requirements under Bagley Keen that we have to comply with are still in effect. Well, this is an option for us. Um, as you know, we've received many compelling comments from Californians about the benefits of providing remote public participation. Uh, for example, next slide, please. Uh, option two, this is uh, kind of the way we've typically handled things so far when we've had in-person meetings. So the board can hold in-person meetings with remote public participation without triggering additional requirements. Um, so all participating board members would participate in person. Staff guests in the public can appear by telephone or teleconference. Of course, the existing notice and transparency requirements still apply. Um, 
And then where we start triggering additional teleconferencing requirements is if board members participate remotely from their homes. Um, so I'll describe that in the next slide. Um, so option three starts to get a little bit more complicated. Um, so the board can hold hybrid meetings with a quorum of at least three board members participating in person with a remote option for up to two board members and the public. Um, if the agency takes this approach, there are some additional requirements. Uh, so board members participating remotely have to keep their cameras on during the open portion of a meeting, and they have to be visible on camera unless it's uh, technologically impracticable, such as due to lack of reliable internet connectivity. And even then, the member must announce the reason for their non-appearance when they turn off their camera. Board members participating remotely um, also must disclose whether there are any individuals 18 and over in the room at the remote location and the general nature of their relationship. Um, remote options for the public must be equivalent to the way in which the board members are participating. For example, if board members participating by, by um, video conference, the public has to be able to participate that way as well. All votes have to be by roll call. And then if the remote public access um, goes down and it can't be restored, then we have to end the meeting and provide notice of that to the public. Um, and then the last option, um, getting more complicated and difficult to read, um, the board can also hold hybrid meetings with one or more board members participating in person. Up to two board members can participate remotely. Additional members can count towards the in-person quorum uh, while participating remotely under certain circumstances. And the public has to be able to participate remotely as well. Um, so getting into the ways in which um, a member participating from a remote location can contribute to the in-person quorum. Um, that's the case if the member has a need related to a physical or mental disability that's not otherwise reasonably accommodated pursuant to the Federal Americans with Disability Act of 1990. And the board member notifies the board at the earliest opportunity possible including at the start of the meeting of their need to participate remotely. And they have to provide a general description of the circumstances relating to their need to participate remotely. Um, then the board has to take action uh, to approve it and request a gen that general description of the circumstances um, for each meeting in which the member seeks to participate remotely. But the board can't require the member to provide a description that exceeds 20 words or disclose any medical diagnosis or disability or disclose personal medical information that's already exempt under existing laws such as the Confidentiality and Medical Information Act. And then all the other requirements of option three still apply. Um, members participating remotely have to be on camera, but have to be a roll call. If the internet goes down, we have to uh, adjourn if we can't get it back up. And that concludes my updates. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. Um, so before we go to the proposal, I wanted to see if board members had um, thoughts or questions on the updates. And I want to thank Ms. Mahoney for putting together um, this very helpful update for us in a very active space, very active legislative space. So, um, so thank you so much for tracking all of this and giving us, um, updating us um, so thoroughly. Um, comments or questions from board members? I will spare everyone my continued and known thoughts about SB 544. Um, and you can refer to my op-ed if you would like to hear my sort of general thoughts on accessibility and including and inclusive board meetings. Um, so I will, um, everyone's heard those before. Um, uh, thank you again, Ms. Mahoney. So with that, shall we turn to the um, memorandum that you provided for us today um, and a little bit of background on the staff's, what I understand to be staff's proposed um, uh, legislative proposal from, from the agency. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so turning to the bill proposal, so consistent with the process adopted last year for taking positions on bills and adopting legislative proposals, um, staff have put together um, a proposal for your consideration to require browsers to include a feature that allows consumers to use opt-out preference signals. Um, so if the board approves staff's recommendation, 
staff would propose the idea to lawmakers to consider taking up the bill in 2024, work with them to develop um, legislation and sponsor and support such legislation. And then to give a bit of a sense of timing, so currently the California legislature is in recess. It will resume in early January. The policy bill introduction deadline is February 16th. Um, bills introduced this year have to advance out of the first house by May 24th. They have to clear the legislature by August 31st, and the governor has till the end of September to make the determination. And if adopted, bills typically go into effect um, January 1st of the following year. Um, so agency staff have informally gotten feedback on the proposal um, with key legislative staff, which is positive. We've also consulted with agency's legal staff before putting this proposal before the board. Um, so briefly, under the CCPA, businesses are required, as you know, to honor our browser um, privacy signals as an opt out of sale. It makes it much easier for consumers to exercise their rights. Um, but to exercise this right, consumers either have to use a browser that uh, supports the opt-out preference signal or take extra steps to find um, and download and set up a browser plugin created by third-party developers. And only a few browsers, um, Mozilla Firefox, Dr. Phil and Brave, currently offer native support for these signals, and they make up a very, very you know, small percentage of the market share. Google Chrome, Microsoft Edge, Apple Safari, um, they make up the vast majority of the market share of the client to offer these signals. Um, so to make it easier for consumers to exercise their rights, we recommend that the board support this legislative proposal to require browser vendors and other platforms or devices as defined by regulation to include a feature that allows users to exercise their California privacy rights through opt-out preference signals as defined by regulation and direct staff to find an author or work with them to develop legislation based on the proposal and sponsor and support such legislation. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Mahoney. Um, comments and questions from the board? Um, Ms. De La Torre? Uh, could you come off mute, please, Ms. De La Torre? As it was mentioned, we did vote on supporting some particular bills last year. At that time, I asked that we develop our um, policy around what we support and we don't support. And the only statement that we have right now is what directly affects the work of the agency. We're effectively picking some privacy right, uh, privacy bills that we support and some that we don't. And I think that's fair. Um, but I would like to um, restate it might request to have a, a statement that's more concrete so that we don't, do, we're not perceived as arbitrary in terms of what we support and we don't support. Um, I was hoping that that would come today. Um, if it is not available today, maybe we could see on next meeting um, that definition. I'm sure that the staff already has some form of criteria, but I would like to see the criteria get it approved. Um, the um, second piece is on in terms of the request to um, sponsor a bill. It's very different. Sponsoring a bill is very different from supporting a bill. It's a significant commitment of resources for the agency. I don't have an understanding of what commitment might be. I know that we're not part of the GO process. So if we do support the bill, it doesn't have to go through the um, through their office to be determined whether it's um, uh, something that they will pursue or not. Um, I imagine that we will have to draft it, we will have to testify, et cetera. So I would like to have an understanding of what commitment of resources, um, any sponsoring of bills uh, entails. And the second piece that I would like also to see is an analysis on the, um, you know, the, the potential for litigation and whether that litigation will end up with uh, effort that will be potentially really significant being um, not effective. And this goes to what a member of Attagar mentioned before because we had a recent experience with a, a age appropriate um, design code. So um, I'm, I'm generally supportive of the idea. I just wanna know what resources we're committing and whether there is going to be an effective um, enactment on the other side that is resilient to litigation before I vote. Thank you, Ms. Delatoy. Ms. Mahoney, do you want to um, respond? And I see Mr. Laird is here as well. 
Yes, um, so these are all very good questions um, with respect to a fuller description of um, the types of bills with which the agency will weigh in on. Uh, we fleshed out, out a bit in the board handbook, um, but also to continue to work to provide uh, more specificity there. Um, happy to discuss further at the next meeting. In terms of uh, time commitment, agree that sponsoring bill is a very large time commitment, um, and that's why staff wanted to focus on this one bill rather than, you know, moving forward with several ideas that we're excited about. Um, so, you know, we'll play a significant role in developing the legislation. You know, we'll answer questions um, from staffers and, and other stakeholders, um, work to get support for the bill, testify, as you mentioned. Um, but I think it makes sense for the agency to play this role, given how closely tied this proposal is to the agency's goals in terms of making it easier for consumers to exercise um, their privacy preferences. And then I'll also point out that um, we did a lot of uh, similar work um, more behind the scenes, you know, after we supported SB 362 to help um, shape that. Um, so there is um, some precedent for the agency getting more involved in legislation. Um, with respect to the legal analysis, um, our legal team has performed an initial analysis, is comfortable recommending that the board uh, approve this proposal and have um, pointed to precedents for similar legislation, such as seatbelt laws that require automobile manufacturers to include these important safety features, um, 911 rules, you know, the FCC requirements um, that all telecom providers transmit 911 calls to a public safety answering point, even if the caller is not a subscriber. And importantly, we're not seeking to require defaults. Consumers would still need to make a choice to enable them, but we think this um, proposal has, has value for consumers. Um, and I'm not sure, Phil, if you want to. I, I yeah, appreciate I, it, oh. and I'm generally supportive. I just would like to see that analysis in some written form provided to the board before we are asked to vote. Um, and I think that there is a perfect opportunity in January to come back and make sure that you, you know, give us that kind of analysis in written form and then and then ask us to vote. I just, can I pause with a, um, a, a process um, question here to Ms. De La Torre's point? Um, Mr. Laird or Ms. Mahoney, could you let us know what staff would need for you to pursue this? I don't have in my mind exactly the legislative schedule and if we were to wait um, with some general approval that it could um, make us miss the legislative cycle or something. It, um, we don't. We don't. If we if they don't start until January. We, we will definitely be within the cycle. That's why you. I'm asking. Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Uh, Mr. Worth? Yeah, I'm less concerned about the legislative process. I'm more concerned about the understanding the legal process that we're probably going to face with these groups. So that would be helpful to understand that before we sign up for it. So what, you know, if you already have a great, if not, let's get something on somebody on board to help us develop a, you know, a realistic plan of what we should expect coming our way if we, if we pursue this. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Um, additional um, comments or questions? And Mr. Laird, did you, um, do you have further that you wanted to say? Sure. Uh, just a couple points I'll make. And that is, first of all, um, as you know, the legislature has its own office of legislative council uh, who reviews bills and kind of for exactly these issues. And um, so they would be doing an independent analysis before any, well, either before or during the legislature's own pursuit. And obviously there would have to be a legislature involved to, to sponsor and carry the bill. Um, beyond that, I'll just say to, um, you know, at this point, this is at a conceptual stage uh, in terms of litigation risk. I mean, to me, there's an open question of sort of who would actually be responsible for enforcing. I think we assume our agency, but depending on how the bill shakes out, um, if there isn't a responsibility in our agency to enforce it, then um, uh, obviously it doesn't carry litigation risk against the agency itself. But um, I just want to reiterate that I'm very supportive of the idea. I just want to 
be able to make that decision on commitment of resources with a little bit more information. Um, Thank you, Ms. Delatore. Um, Mr. McTaggart? Yeah, just really quickly, I uh, I support the idea of having some kind of process, you know, uh, in place to think about it. But I also support the notion of increasing privacy through um, legislative means. That's why we put in the uh, amendment process that we did. And I'll just make the same same pitch I always do. If we if we have effective enforcement of the do not sell, do not share buttons on every single page that collects your information as per statute, we won't have to do this because the I think the browser and device manufacturer will rush to implement this so that they don't have to have a world where every single page that collects your information displays this button because they'll, they'll all be so horrified at that that they'll want to have this uh, uh, provision that takes that allows the 135 uh, section 135b uh, exemption to take place. But anyway, I support the I support the notion. That's just me wasting your time. No, thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. I know it's important because, as ever, we have a substantive question, um, which is shaped by a procedural question, um, and we have a procedural um, question as as well. Um, Ms. Mahoney. I just wanted to point out, you know, the reason why staff made the recommendation that we did in order to, um, you know, allow staff to develop the legislation, work with legislators um, and support and sponsor the bill um, is because it'd be, you know, more difficult to uh, find one of those legislators if it's not clear whether or not that at the end of this process, the agency would support. So it's directly related to the potential success of this proposal. In terms of timeline, you know, the bill introduction deadline is in February, um, but, you know, getting um, language to ledge council is in January. Um, again, you know, we're already in December. Um, so these are the reasons why we recommended um, a faster timeline. And I think that there might be a middle ground. I wouldn't want to impede the process. If there is a need to propose language in January, let's allow the agency to go ahead and do that. But um, I also am mindful of the limited resources that we have um, that are tax funded. And I want to make sure that we invest them in things that are um, uh, pragmatically helpful. And uh, Mr. McTaggart just mentioned there's a, another path to potentially get into the same place that wouldn't necessarily uh, require the legislature, which is an uncertain process, by the way. Um, I mean, we could invest significant resources from the agency and not have a law on the other side. So I think there is not, um, there's no need for that delay in terms of preparing that language if, if the agency would like to shove that around. But I don't want to vote without knowing the resources that we are committing and the, um, you know, some actual analysis on, on the um, viability of the, of the um, law one, once it goes into place. Because this, this is one that I anticipate we will have litigation around. Um, and so I just want to be mindful of the resources that we have and how we invest them. Uh, thank you, Ms. De La Torre and Mr. McTaggart and, and, and everything. I um, uh, would suggest perhaps um, something like that. So what I'm hearing is a little bit of a chicken and an egg issue. Um, it seems to me we don't have the ability as a regulatory agency of actually sponsoring or carrying um, legislation. What we can do is um, have the board and thus the agency um, support legislation um, that legislators would, of course, um, be the ones to actually um, carry it. And given these timelines um, for the legislative process, um, I'm wondering if, and it sounds to me like people are supportive in principle, I'm wondering if it would be acceptable to the board and would also give staff what is needed in a practical sense. If we were to approve this in principle um, and to be clear that we are um, authorizing staff to work with the legislature um, and that we will, to work with the legislature and advance 
um, putting together what the actual bill would look like um, uh, so that, um, but, but also to expect that we would be informed of any um, uh, legal issues that staff needs us to know um, that come through the legislative council's office or otherwise before we finally um, we finally um, finally or that we just sorry that we expect that that goes back because I see this the chicken and egg thing right um, if I'm a legislator I want to know um, in principle at least um, about support um, before I move forward but I completely understand what Ms. De La Torre um, is is mentioning as well. Before, and I just want to highlight before I'm sorry, before 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 we get to this, I just want to ask if that would work as a practical sense from Mr. Laird and, and Ms. Mahoney. All right, <laughs> sorry, Ms. De La Torre. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to highlight there is a big difference between supporting legislation. That is a very low um, uh, commitment in terms of resources and sponsoring. And I think that I understand what we're talking about is sponsoring. And I'm not against voting to sponsor legislation, but I believe that we should be providing more information before we are asked to commit the resources that will go into that. It's not just saying I support the bill. We will have to find somebody who will carry it and we will um, have to draft it. And it, it's a much, much, much bigger uh, commitment. I, I understand. And okay. it's not common um, that um, agencies will, will, will take that step. It's not unheard of, but it's certainly not common. And it, it, it typically happens only when the GO office approves it. Uh, we won't have to seek that approval because of the way we are created. So I, I just wanna be mindful of taking that role that the GO uh, will have on other proposals and considering the um, commitment at the board level. And then I would just like to add, I mean, in my experience with sponsoring, it definitely differs, uh, the workload differs depending on the author and um, the agreements um, of the uh, division of workloads um, between them. So it can vary a great deal. So why don't we, um, maybe we have a motion around reaching out and trying to identify a sponsor and start that initial commitment. And then we can come back in January with that full analysis and just vote on supporting the, the bill um, forward. Well, I do think I, um, in principle, um, uh, I'm not um, opposed. I just wanna be sure Ms. Mahoney um, is able to help us sort of help her since we are um, since we are supportive in principle and what is necessary from us, Ms. Mahoney, in order to get to the place that Ms. De La Torre is describing, for example. Um, I I'm I just want to be sure that we're not um, not arming you with our sense that in principle we really support this if that's going to be helpful um, in terms of moving things forward um, before January? Um, you know, obviously it would, you know, staff's recommendation would be to have the delegation, you know, for staff to work with the author and, and be able to support the bill and sponsor. Um, that would be the ideal um, situation. But, you know, I understand that this is our first time um, putting forward um bill language um so my goal is to get um you know some sort of agreement moving forward to to go ahead with this proposal thank you Ms. mahoney mr lay yeah i mean i i'm gonna be honest like I, I do this a lot and most of the time you're trying to finalize the language and, and get the the people on board in, in november uh if you're trying to do a bill properly and you know, in, enough time to build the coalition and support. Obviously, you know, you have spot bills, you have things figured out last minute. Um, but you know, I, I think what would be helpful is like if we did develop this legislation, right? If there was a mandate to require companies not pro like inhibit consumers from expressing their opt-out signals through their browser architecture, you know, would the board support it? Um, 
I know we don't have the language, but it, it's it, I don't I just don't see an author willing to put their name on it and uh, spend their staff resources if if we don't if if you know the the CPPA is going to be like no we don't actually like it in in January or or whatever board meeting. Um, so you know we we aren't going to give if we don't come a decision on how we feel about the legislation at least in concept. I don't think it's going to be super helpful for uh, Ms. Mahoney in in saying like you know if we get this done the board's going to support it. So I I think that Mr. Lay comments might have offered the solution here. Maybe we vote to support the concept of the legislation, and then we don't necessarily need to vote to sponsor it, right? And and then when we have the information, um, we can make that decision. Because I would, if, if this was a proposal to just support uh, a, a, a bill that we know somebody's going to present and sponsor, and sponsor um, I will not be asking for an analysis on resources on our end because that has very low impact in terms of resources. Thank you, Ms. De La Troy. Um, in that case, um, what are reactions to a motion to approve staff's legislative proposal um, to require browser vendors, et cetera, to include this feature um, in concept um, with the understanding that the board will be informed um, as to updates in January? I think that could work. We could vote to support the concept of the bill and then take back this once we get a report on um, resources and, and feasibility. Um, Mr. Lay, I just asked because you're the other legislative appointee. <laughs> I think, I mean, that's fine. I think that's the best we can do today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Lay. Um, Ms. Mahoney, would that um, help support the um, endeavor? Um, so just to be clear, would, um, let's see, so at the next meeting, um, would I be expected just to provide an update or would there be a need for another? So I think that Mr. Worth and I at least were nodding about the update. I, so in my view, and I'm just, this is my view on the fly, um, would be that we want to give you the tools that you need to explore this in a concrete way and help the legislature understand our support of the concept and that you would bring back to us um, things that have come up that we need to know about. So for example, Ms. De La Torre asked about costs and what it would take in terms of uh, resources. Um, uh, Mr. Worth um, mentioned or um, followed on Ms. De La Torre um, the question about any sort of legal impediments that we haven't um, anticipated yet um, in order to be sure that we agree um, that we're on the right track. Okay, that sounds entirely reasonable. My assumption this whole time would that I'd be providing um, plenty of updates and information to the board moving forward. Okay. Um, let me see if I can um, put that together um, so that we have something in front of us. Um, I would ask for a motion to approve staff's legislative proposal to require browser vendors and other platforms or devices as defined by regulation to include a feature that allows users to exercise their California privacy rights through opt-out preference signals um, as defined by regulation um, in concept that this is the plan that we in concept support and to direct staff to pursue the legislative proposal with the California legislature, um, coming back to update the board on um, uh, as necessary um, topics that we've discussed today. I'd okay. like to move. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, may I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Worth. I have a motion and a second, Ms. Allen. Could you please um, uh, find out if we have public comments on this item? Sure, this is for agenda item number five, le legislation update and agency proposals. Um, if you would like to make a comment at this time, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature of Zoom or pressing star nine on your phone. 
Um, again, this is for agenda item number five, legislative update and agency proposal. Uh, we have uh, one public comment at the moment. So I, Matt Schwartz, I am going to go ahead and unmute you and allow you to talk. You have three minutes. Go ahead and start when you're ready. Good afternoon. Once again, my name is Matt Schwartz, policy analyst at Consumer Reports. And thank you to the board for the opportunity to comment. <clears throat> Uh, Consumer Reports supports the CPPA's staff draft memo and its recommendation for the board to support legislation that would require browser vendors and other platforms and devices to include a feature that allows users to exercise their California privacy rights through opt-out preference signals. Uh, Consumer Reports is a firm believer in the utility of universal opt-out tools. We think they make it far easier for consumers to effectuate their rights under privacy laws. Um, Consumer Reports has previously conducted research into the usability of opt-out uh, rights prior to the existence of universal opt-out tools. And we found that consumers struggle to complete opt-out requests. And we've also found that companies often erect burdensome opt-out processes that have the effect of reducing take-up. For those reasons, CR has played a key role in the development and implementation of universal opt-out tools, particularly global privacy control, which is now considered a legally binding opt-out mechanism under CCPA. We've advocated for universal opt-out provisions to be included in privacy legislation around the country. And we've been excited to see universal opt-out become a more standard facet of privacy legislation. Uh, most recently, we supported the California Delete Act, which allows consumers to make uh, to universally delete their information held by all of the state's registered data brokers at once. Uh, despite, or perhaps because of, the fact that we know that these types of tools work and that consumers tend to enthusiastically adopt them when presented the opportunity, several of the major browser vendors and operating systems do not natively uh, support universal opt-out mechanisms, which severely limit the reach of these technologies. Of course, many of these entities plainly benefit from suppressing opt-out choices, since in many cases, greater adoption of opt-outs would reduce their own ability to track or otherwise monetize consumers' data um, and maintain a competitive advantage in the marketplace. In any case, the status quo means that many consumers might not even realize that they have the ability to take control of their privacy in a more systemic manner. We think that legislation requiring browser vendors and other platforms to at least present consumers with the choice to operationalize their privacy rights by universal mechanisms would absolutely advance the purposes of CCPA and give consumers more choices over the treatment of their personal information. And we think that the board should support this rulemaking, uh, or support this undertaking. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Matt Schwartz. Um, Ms. Allen, is there further public comment? Um, at this point, if you would like to make a comment on agenda item number five, legislative update and agency proposals, please go ahead and raise your hand using the raise hand feature of Zoom or pressing star nine. Chair Irvin, at this time, I'm not seeing any more hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. In that case, um, I would ask uh, you to please conduct the roll call vote on the motion as stated and seconded. Great, this is for, uh, yes, this motion is for agenda five, as stated by, previously stated by the chair. Uh, board member De La Torre? Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay? Aye. Uh, Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart? Aye. McTaggart, aye. Board member Worth? Aye. Worth, aye. Chair Urban? Aye. Urban, aye. Madam Chair, you have five ayes and no notes. Thank you very much. The motion carries with a vote of five to zero. Uh, yes, Mr. Worth. I just think this might be a good jumping off point for me. I don't want to have to okay. depart during the middle of a, an item. Of course. Of course. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Worth. No, thank you all. All right. Have, thanks, have a good Mr. holiday, too. You, too. Happy okay. holidays to you. Thank you. Um, and thank you very much, um, Ms. Mahoney, and everyone who's been working on this. And we will look forward um, to what comes next. Um, with that, I would um, we will move to agenda item number seven, 
which is an item regarding the California Privacy Protection Agency's intergovernmental engagement and priorities. This item is responsive to board discussion regarding updates on CPPA engagement, um, which we've talked about in previous board meetings. I believe Ms. De La Torre mentioned this in our September meeting, and this will also be presented by Ms. Mahoney. Um, Ms. Mahoney, please go ahead. Um, thank you, Chairperson um, and members of the board. As you know, our statute directs us to work um, with privacy authorities and other jurisdictions to work towards consistency and privacy protections. Where possible, under this direction, our agency regularly participates in national and international forums that relate to our authority. Um, so in this item, first I'll go over an update on multi-state engagement um, and then international engagement, including looking to next year. Uh, so with respect to multi-state privacy laws, um, we've been actively engaging now approximately 13 states have comprehensive privacy laws. Seven states, including California, require businesses to honor uh, browser privacy signals as an opt-out of sale, subject to discussion of the earlier item. We expect this activity to continue next year and perhaps, perhaps expand this fall state, such as Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Michigan. Worked on privacy legislation in many cases during recess to prepare to move bills quickly um, at the start of the new year. Uh, so most of these states go into session in, in January. Um, I expect that over 20 states will seriously consider privacy legislation next year and that many of these bills will be adopted. Uh, we have and will continue to engage by sharing California's privacy framework. I also expect that next year there'll be a lot of legislative interest in ADM and AI. Um, on the state level, staff participated in a multi-state working group this fall to hear about different approaches to AI and ADM, and we'll continue to share the draft um, ADM and risk assessment drafts as they evolve to uh, widely encourage consistency as legislators can consider bills on these topics. Um, and we expect to continue to step up our policy engagement in the coming year as we build capacity. So on to international engagement. Um, we followed a similar approach as directed by statute. Um, we're now a member of several international bodies. Um, the Global Privacy Assembly, a network of over 100 data protection authorities, staff attended the annual GPA meeting this fall. We're also a member of the Asia Pacific Privacy Authorities, a similar organization for a subset organizations um, in the Asia Pacific region. APBA meets twice yearly. Um, the staff have not attended um, in person, largely because of conflicts with board meetings, but we've attended remotely and provided updates at the last three meetings um, by video conference. Uh, we're also members of the Global Privacy Enforcement Network which facilitates coordination on privacy enforcement initiatives. And lastly, we're in the process of applying to the Ibero American Network of Data Protection at the suggestion of board member De La Torre. Um, I wanted to go into a bit more detail on uh, the Global Privacy Assembly uh, meeting. Um, because it was a very productive trip, our main goal was to introduce our new um, head of enforcement, Mike Macko, um, to set the stage for um, future collaborations as appropriate, um, but we also have a lot of value to add to the European framework. From a policy perspective, there's a lot of interest in aspects of California law that make it easier for consumers to exercise their privacy rights, specifically the Global Opt-out, the New Delete Act. Uh, we highlighted these policies to the French, German, Spanish, the Central Authority, the Federal Trade Commission, among others, also connected with the British, Canadians, Norwegians, and Japanese. Um, Executive Director Sultani also recently traveled to Europe um, to further build on these discussions, have an opportunity to present um, the California privacy perspective to a number of senior um, EU policymakers. He was able to meet with the Euro European Data Protection Supervisor, the European Data Protection Board, the French CNIL, and the OECD um, to further encourage consistency. Um, so looking ahead to the future, uh, the next GPA meeting will be in Jersey in the Channel Islands next fall. We expect that APPA will hold a meeting this summer, um, which we'll likely want to participate in either remotely or in person. And I'm happy to share more information um, about meetings um, for the Ibero American Network as they become available. Um, per the request of the board, I plan to provide an annual update at a regular meeting on staff's priorities and plan activities for intergovernmental engagement um, and invite input and feedback from the board and provide follow-up information if necessary. Similar to the process for domestic conferences, um, staff supports board members attending meetings of international bodies. Um, 
but we are looking to have a process in place. So we request the board members notify staff if there is a meeting of an international body of which the agency is a member that they would like to attend. And then we can coordinate with the chairperson and manage logistics to ensure that we're complying with existing law, including that no more than two board members are planning to, to go. Um, and the goals are to comply with existing law and to, to streamline uh, the process for this engagement. And this concludes my update. Thank you very much, Ms. Mahoney. Um, and thanks to Ms. De La Torre um, for suggesting this in the way that she did, because I think it helped us sort of bundle some really exciting news and some um, a sort of process thoughts um, into, um, into, an efficient, um, uh, into an efficient agenda item. Are there um, comments or questions um, from the board? No? Okay. Um, in that case, um, Ms. Allen, would you mind um, asking if there's public comments on this item? Sure, we are discussing agenda item number seven, which is about CPPA intergovernmental engagement um, updates and priorities. If you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please go ahead and raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or press star nine if you have dialed in on the phone. Again, this is for agenda item number seven, CPPA, intergovernmental engagement. Chair Irvin, I'm seeing your hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, with that, I would actually like to um, take uh, one last item out of order and move to um, agenda item number nine, which is future agenda items, um, in part because I think it follows nicely from the discussion we've had thus far, and in part because I wanna give um, the public the opportunity to offer us um, any Ida, any thoughts off the agenda um, uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, so as a reminder, this is our agenda item um, for discussion of future agenda items, and it uh, allows um, both the board and the public um, to suggest things for future um, board meeting agendas, um, although we can't discuss them in detail. Um, we can um, propose them, and I'm keeping a list um, and say a little bit maybe about why you propose it. Um, there are a number of different um, kinds of agenda items that members have proposed. Um, we just had one that Ms. De La Torre had proposed. Um, I know Mr. McTaggart has used this time um, from time to time um, to propose that we discuss um, potential regulations and so forth. Um, and um, so let's um, have that discussion now. I will first um, run through my um, list that I have right now. Um, one is, of course, the legislative proposal updates we um, recently spoke about with Ms. Um, Mahoney under agenda item number seven. Um, uh, another is the regulation updates and requests for, for board feedback and votes as appropriate, um, discussed with the regulations we've discussed today, the draft regulations. Um, on our regularized calendar for January, um, we have our regular board briefing on the, what's called the January 10 budget um, from the governor um, in order to um, have an update on that and provide thoughts to staff. And we have um, uh, relatedly um, a direction, uh, an item to direct the staff on spring budget changes and priorities to feed into that process. Um, just as a highlight um, for the, or sorry, just, just so we can look out a little bit further on the regularized calendar for March, um, we have a public affairs um, annual awareness re um, report and priorities on that. It would be good to check in on that. And we know that we will probably have some regulation um, to talk about in one or both of those meetings. Um, I'd also like to remind everybody that we um, will be doing our next stage of strategic planning. Um, we did not schedule it for today, um, given the um, very intense amount of substance um, on uh, regulations and so forth we needed to talk about. Um, the rulemaking process subcommittee, Ms. De La Torre and I will have an update at the appropriate time. Um, and we will be, um, uh, uh, we will um, be talking about the chief privacy auditor position again at the appropriate time. So that is my sort of list that I've kept so far and my pen is ready um, to add things. Ms. De La Torre? Uh, please unmute yourself. I I have nothing to add. Thank you for keeping the list. Um, but I do have a question. The the board book that 
the agency is working on, and it was referred to today as where the um, description of what directly affects the work of the agency is. Do we expect that to be in front of us in the January meeting? Is that kind of, I, I know we might not be able to commit, but is that the timing that we have in mind for that? Um, I'm not certain, um, but Ms. Mahoney mentioned the handbook, which is something that I forgot. Um, and let me just make sure that I have it um, on my list um, because we will, um, um, as you I'm sure are, remember, um, the handbook has been with staff for feedback from board members. And so that will come back um, at the appropriate time. Um, and I would expect not too long from now. I just wanna leave staff some ability to help juggle. But do we have a general idea, maybe, Mr. Clare? I mean, without committing, is that kind of... Um, Mr. Clare, is it, I mean, is there any um, problem I'm not seeing with saying January or, or maybe March for these things? And I'm sorry, if, if just, I want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding the item. Can you please uh, state it again? Uh, just... Well, I should say there are two potential parts. One is the handbook, which has a variety of different aspects that people have commented on. And then Ms. De La Torre asked specifically about um, more detail on when something affects the agency. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm just asking about the handbook. When's the handbook? Oh, okay. yeah. The handbook uh, for January. We'll be prepared to bring it back at that stage. Perfect. Thank you. That was helpful. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Um, uh, Mr. McTaggart. Yeah, super quick. I just would love to add to the list of eventual rules uh, and I think it's just worth bringing up in public um, the notion that the 185A7 gives us the responsibility to promulgate regulations around deletion. And I think it would be a neat feature for people to say, I'd like to be able to delete some parts of my information, not all of it. So I could delete, you know, where I'd been for the last month, but not necessarily my whole account. That's just, if we could just add it to the list, that's probably a Miss Kim thing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McTaggart. And I have it on the list. Other um, potential agenda items from board members? All right, well, we have a we have a strong list. <laughs> we have a robust list. Um, uh, with that, Ms. Allen, um, may I ask if there's public um, comments on this item? Sure, we are on agenda item number nine, future agenda items. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature of Zoom or star nine uh, on your phone. And we do have one public comment at this time. So Nicole Smith, I'm going to going to go ahead and allow you to talk and unmute you. And you have three minutes. You can begin when you're ready. All right. Thank you so much for the board and all of your work that you've put into this marathon meeting. I'll make this very quick since the hour is very late. Um, a couple of years ago, and this is pre-COVID, this is actually pre-GDPR, when Kamala Harris was our state attorney general. I was at a meeting in DC of the IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals, and one of the former members of either EU parliament or EU commission was on a panel and made a comment that California with all of its legislative activity in the privacy field may qualify in the near future as a region that has adequate data privacy laws. And that's a concept of adequacy decision which allows the free transfer of data. And that was huge at the time. I don't think many people paid that much attention to it because there was at the time no CPA that could take the lead on that. But if we had an adequacy decision that would allow for the free flow of data between EU and US companies, and certainly for Silicon Valley and any company that does data processing with all of the security and vendor vetting, third-party vetting that we do, it would lower the barrier and make the ease of data exchange a lot better for California customers, uh, excuse me, California companies. So I encourage the CPPA to consider that perhaps not in the immediate future, but at some time um, looking for an adequacy decision from the EU because they've already sent signals that they would be amenable to this. And it would be a tremendous 
um, boom uh, to for California corporations that adhere to all of these laws and are very, very critical about sharing data with third parties. We're very careful and, you know, we're minding our P's and Q's and it would be great to have an adequacy decision. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nicole Smith. Ms. Allen, is there further public comment? All right, this is for um, agenda item number nine, future, uh, future comments or future uh, agenda items. Um, if anyone has a public comment, please raise your hand using the raise hand feature of Zoom or pressing star nine on your phone. Future Urban, at this time, there's no, no other hands. Thank you very much, Ms. Allen. Um, with that, then we will travel back one agenda item to request um, public comment on items that, or on issues and items that are not on the agenda. Um, as a reminder, this is a um, an item that is available for the public specifically um, to um, bring up topics that are not on the agenda for today. Um, as um, uh, before we proceed with public comment, um, please do note that the only action the board can take in response is to listen to comments and consider whether it will discuss the topic at a future meeting. No other action can be taken on the item at this meeting. Um, we do not intend to, see, to seem non-responsive. Um, following these guidelines is critical to ensure that the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act um, is followed and to avoid compromising the commenter's goals or um, the board's mission. And um, so with that, um, I would ask Ms. Allen to let us know if there is public comment um, on items not on the agenda. Yep, this is uh, agenda item number eight, public comment, comment on items not on the agenda. If you would like to make a public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand feature or pressing star nine on your phone. Again, uh, last call. Uh, this is agenda item number eight, public comment on items not on the agenda. Um, if you would like to make a public comment, please indicate so now. Chair Urban, I see no hands. Thank you um, very much, um, Ms. Allen. With that, we will move to our final agenda item, which is adjournment. I would like to um, reiterate um, our last speaker's thanks to the board um, and to the staff um, and to the public um, for an attentive, substantive, and thoughtful meeting um, with some very complex topics underway. And um, uh, uh, thank everybody for that and look forward to seeing you um, when we again meet. Um, uh, with that, our final agenda item is adjournment. Um, and with the thanks and a very um, wish, a wish for very um, warm, bright, and happy holidays. Um, to all. May I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I will make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Lay. May I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ms. De La Torre. Ms. Allen, there is a motion um, on the table and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Could you please conduct the roll call vote? Yes, the motion is for adjournment. Uh, board member De La Torre. Aye. De La Torre, aye. Board member Lay. Aye. Lay, aye. Board member McTaggart. Aye. McTaggart, aye. Uh, board member Worth. Board, uh, Chair, Chair Urban. Aye. Chair Urban, uh, Madam Chair, you have four ayes and one. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Allen, and to the board. Uh, with a vote of four uh, to nothing, this meeting of the California Privacy Protection Agency Board is hereby adjourned. Thank you very much, everyone.